So today we're going to talk about uh, open policy agent, uh, which is uh, called by the creators of it, uh, OPA. Are you seeing my screen, Chris? I sure am. Yep. All right, great. So um, let me get into PowerPoint selected. So the agenda today, I am going to go through some slides. I'm sorry. I hate slides. I think most of us do. I am going to go through some slides to kind of set the stage for using OPA uh, with cloud security. Okay. Um, but I'm also going to spend some time showing you around the OPA ecosystem and showing you code. If you're not a coder, stick around because it, I, I will explain it in, in very great detail such that you will be able to follow along. I'm sorry, my, my video camera seems to be uh, glitching a little bit, uh, giving me kind of a max headroom effect, but uh, we'll just get through it. All right, we're gonna go through an overview of misconfiguration risk. The reason we're gonna do that as it relates to cloud is what I'm gonna show you around OPA is focused on getting cloud security right and that's almost all misconfiguration. Uh, we believe at Fugue that policy as code is mandatory for automating security and compliance in the cloud. I'm gonna give you an introduction to open policy agent and policy as code as a concept and as a reality. Uh, and then we're gonna do some deep dives into the OPA toolbox just to show you how this thing works. Finally, I'm gonna talk about how to get started with, with these technologies, uh, and hopefully we'll have some time for uh, Q&A. All right, so cloud misconfiguration is the number one cloud risk, and that's why we're going to use policy as code to address it. Uh, many of the advanced cloud misconfigurations, that sounds funny, uh, because an, what's an advanced misconfiguration? What we mean there is misconfigurations that advanced hackers can take advantage of are not seen as compliance violations. They're, they're not caught typically by things like uh, CIS or NIST. Um, therefore, they're not seen as vulnerabilities, which makes them uh, easy to miss, hard to find, and also only apparent in the full context of an environment. So when you build a VPC, you might have built that VPC correctly on AWS, for example, but it could be that something within that VPC and how it communicates with something in S3 is creating the vulnerability. So you have to, you have to look at the thing as a whole. Uh, these, therefore, these misconfigurations are very, very common in cloud environments generally. Uh, we say enterprise here because uh, scale uh, tends to multiply the number of misconfigurations. So uh, if you're operating at large scale on cloud, you probably have a lot of these out there. And when you read the uh, major breaches that we see all the time in the cloud, uh, these are almost always uh, part of the issue. Okay, uh, at FUG, we do a survey about every year of uh, folks who are operating at, at large scale on the cloud. And we don't ask them about our product. And, and by the way, this isn't gonna be a product demo to you. I will show you how we use OPA a little bit. It's really about OPA though. Um, so these folks who are operating at scale in the cloud, we ask a lot of questions around cloud security issues. So a few we asked uh, last year, um, these uh, statistics, these figures uh, came from that survey of about 300 organizations operating at scale in cloud. 84% said they were concerned that they had already been hacked and didn't know about it. Uh, that's a very good concern to have. Very often cloud breaches go unnoticed until the data shows up somewhere or the hacker brags on social media. They, they are hard to detect. 92% um, were concerned that they're vulnerable to a cloud breach. This should really be 100%. I was at AWS prior to founding Fugue uh, I've worked in national security uh, software for years. Um, I'm very familiar with the domain and everyone should be worried about this. The 8% who said they weren't, I suspect are either, um, uh, you know, not, not really using cloud or uh, are getting hacked right now. 
And then uh, three quarters, 76% said they thought misconfiguration of resources, misconfiguration risk will increase or stay the same. Uh, my view on this is quite simple. If you're using new cloud services, those have new attack profiles for bad guys. So as you add services to the mix, you're adding attack surface to the mix. And as you add resources in the cloud, even using the same services you had been using, you're also adding attack surface. So if you're growing in cloud and using new services, uh, misconfiguration risk is generally speaking rising. All right, a little bit about hacker strategy and why automation is so important. Uh, in, the, in the kind of old days, uh, and this still happens, right? Uh, the hackers would target an organization and then create or find vulnerabilities. So a couple examples of this, aside from every Hollywood movie about hacking ever, in the real world, a couple examples are things like Stuxnet, which was clearly targeting uh, the Iranian nuclear program, or when uh, Sony Pictures made a movie that the North Koreans didn't like, uh, they went after Sony executives, right? So this is kind of the classic idea of, um, of hacking. But what we see vastly more often now is automation, where the hackers know what misconfigurations to look for or vulnerabilities to look for. They write programs to find them. And then they get a shopping list of organizations to attack secondarily. And this is true even in the really big major hacks that you read about in the news. So John Breeden here says uh, uh, from CSO Online, uh, skilled or well-funded hacker groups are employing automation to discover and exploit misconfigured cloud assets within hours of their deployment. Uh, what we've seen is it's minutes. So this uh, hours might be kind of rosy, uh, hence the need for automation and where policy as code comes in. So I wanna take a step back here and talk about how policy as code works because code typically meant building stuff, logical functions uh, uh, you know, to operate on data and to perform transactions. So in programming languages, you know, general purpose programming languages, you're typically expressing, you know, some kind of function and doing some kind of data processing. And the compilers and interpreters and debuggers uh, provide feedback to the developer on whether it's functioning correctly. Well, policy as code is similar in ways, but is narrower in focus. So with policy as code, what you're really trying to express is your security rules, your, your security posture and your, your policies and you're expressing those as code. So that's a little different. You're not building uh, you know, data processing functions, you're building security functions. And the evaluation though, can provide feedback to the developer really quickly as to whether or not what you're doing is safe. So with uh, traditional uh, general purpose programming languages, the tool chain provides you information like, oh, you, you cast a, a variable the wrong way um, or whatnot. But with policy as code, you'll get feedback from the tool chain saying uh, something that you uh, chose to, to do is not safe and therefore you should not do that. But it happens really, really quickly because it's expressed as code. And, and this is one of the massive benefits of um, using policy as code is the developers who are now doing infrastructure as code and building stuff in cloud uh, can, um, can get that feedback without going through a security audit. So uh, uh, I just saw my dog's face entering the picture. Uh, he's laying here. Uh, I, I apologize if he, uh, if he uh, gets in the way or makes any noises. Okay, so let's talk about open policy agent. Uh, we at Fugue are really excited about open policy agent because, uh, well, we have a lot of patents on policy as code here at Fugue, and we wrote a bunch of uh, language compilers and things like that. And then Open Policy Agent came along, and we saw that probably for the first time, there is a potential open standard 
for policy as code, rather than a bunch of proprietary languages or pseudo languages, which is kind of what the past was. So um, OPA is now sponsored by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It is a declarative language. It's a real language based on data log. And I'll get into what I mean by a real language as opposed to a kind of pseudo language or, or semi language um, using a language called Rego, which again is based on data log. It's declarative and it's a query language. It can validate any JSON data structure. And the beauty of that is we've kind of decided that JSON is gonna be the way we throw data between services and so on for the most part uh, and express in many cases configuration, which is what we're gonna talk about here. Uh, and that means OPA is uh, applicable to a wide variety of cloud use cases. So I'm gonna talk about cloud infrastructure today. Uh, what you see most folks doing with OPA has more to do with things like Kubernetes, transactions, you know, microservice to microservice in a Kubernetes uh, environment and checking authorization for API calls, things like that, uh, doing API governance, et cetera. So, but the beauty here is it's applicable to lots and lots of use cases. And, and that's why few were really early adopters of OPA is it's, it's a potential standard way to handle a bunch of different problems in an open way. It has a really robust tooling ecosystem. I'm gonna show you today the kind of uh, native uh, OPA open source, but also some stuff we've put out there open source uh, and free uh, that you can use with, with OPA. Um, I don't think I need to read through these bullets. I covered some of these points, um, but just to kind of paint a picture historically most policy as code, and, and historically meaning today, most policy as code, for example, in like cloud security applications, Fugue is a cloud security service and application, uh, most of them use proprietary kind of pseudo languages. Often they're uh, kind of partial implementations of SQL, but they're map, they're stuck on one, one product or one project. You can also see this with libraries uh, that are uh, actually proprietary expressions, but using a, a, a commonly used language like Python or something like this. So with Open Policy Agent, we just think that the future is having a standard way to do policy as code, uh, and it should be expressed as a domain specific language to policy, in our opinion, uh, rather than uh, trying to lever uh, something proprietary or wedge it into a general purpose language, they, they just have different goals. All right, so one common misconception is that you can't do policy as code as it relates to cloud, particularly cloud infrastructure, unless you're doing infrastructure as code. That is absolutely not true. And in fact, infrastructure as code templates cannot fully capture what you need to in order to perform policy as code throughout the entire life cycle. So you have to be able to apply policy as code no matter how infrastructure was made. It's good to check infrastructure as code templates before they are turned into infrastructure. You can catch maybe half, probably less, of the misconfigurations there. So it's a good thing to do, but it's not good enough. And also you don't need to be doing infrastructure as code to use policy as code. It can be applied to real world running infrastructure. Um, we believe that you need policy as code because of the disparate methods used to create and modify cloud. So you might run some Terraform. We actually have an open source project I'm going to show you for using OPA to check Terraform templates. Um, you might be running Ansible, you might be running CloudFormation. In most enterprises that we see, there's a mix of those with also things like uh, uh, scripts and people going in the console. So your policy as code really should be an umbrella over all that stuff, no matter how it was made. Otherwise you have gaps in your strategy and in your security. So we believe policy as code should be used all the way through the software development lifecycle from design time, where you can catch 
like I said, maybe half, maybe a third, uh, to deploy time using policy as code to prevent uh, insecure and injurious changes to be made through uh, build fails, things like that. And then once it's deployed, because cloud infrastructure is generally speaking mutable, it can be changed and it does get changed. You need that same policy as code to tell you if anything dangerous happens post deployment, like somebody going in in a maintenance window and opening uh, a, a hole in a, in a security group. All right, let's um, get out of PowerPoint and start showing you around OPA itself. So uh, I'm going to switch here to doing a little web browsing, and I'm going to show you some code too. So uh, here, this is just the Open Policy Agent website. All right, and the reason I'm showing you this is primarily to show you this diagram right here. So what is OPA? It is both a policy language, which as I said is a declarative and is really a query language, um, but it's also a runtime. And that's one of the reasons it's so cool. You can deploy it both as a daemon and as a library. I'm, I'm seeing here some Q&A come in, so I'm just gonna, come on, Zoom. I need to get my chat window open. Sorry, I'm taking a pause here. I just wanna make sure uh, there's nothing going on that uh, is a problem. Cause you never know on these virtual events, you know, they're, they're awesome and they're a lot of fun, but um, sometimes things are going off the rails and you can't tell from your end. All right, it looks like we're good. All right, so you can run it as a daemon. What does that mean? If you think about a microservice architecture um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an old guy, so to me, it's just service architectures, right? They should be the right size. But what we're talking about are distributed systems. So you can stand up OPA as a daemon to be called over the network. And that's pretty cool. For some use cases, that's the best way to deploy it. Um, in our particular case, we use it as a library. And it's great that you have this option because you know a, a network call is about a hundred times slower, uh, ten to a hundred times slower than a local call, right? Depending on your network, it can be much slower than that. So we at Fugue do billions of OPA evaluations a day, so we use it as a library, and that's kind of awesome. You can deploy it either way. It's a Go program. Uh, let's go jump over to their GitHub, and we'll poke around a little bit at that. Why? There we go. My mouse cursor has disappeared for me. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's just take a quick look. You can see here it's it's completely open source, 4,000 stars, uh, almost 500 forks. So it's getting used a lot. Um, again, it's a Go program. It's, it's very, very solidly built. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we at Fugue had written our own uh, pure functional uh, policy as code and infrastructure as code language with a compiler based on the Haskell type system. We're pretty nerdy about this stuff. And we take our computer science pretty seriously here. And when we saw OPA, we got pretty excited because it's actually really good. It's, it's very well implemented. Um, data log is a, 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 a well understood language. It's, that's a serious language with a lot of the features you would want. And uh, we're really big, big fans, but so are a lot of other folks. So let's take a look at the adopters here. So this is just their GitHub repo. And you can see Atlassian is using OPA, uh, BNY Mellon, Capital One, Chef, Cloudflare. Uh, we're in this list. We were a very early adopter a couple of years ago of OPA. Goldman Sachs, Netflix, Pinterest, uh, SAP, T-Mobile, uh, Yelp. So, so the reason this matters uh, for you when you're making a choice in this area um, is OPA will give engineers valuable skills in the market. And that's a really powerful thing. If you're an engineer, you know, you don't want to learn something that only works in some narrow use case. You want to learn something that is a marketable skill that you're, 
you know, that, that learning time is gonna be leveraged on many projects. Well, OPA has the kind of profile uh, that, that will get you that. Um, yeah, so let's see here. You can, you can contribute to it. We contribute to it quite a lot. As I said, it is a uh, Go project. Uh, we're big fans of Go here. Um, it's not coincidental that API authorization is the top of the list here. That's what most folks that are using OPA are doing with it in my experience. All right, so what we do at Fugue is quite different. What we do at Fugue, and uh, let me show you an open source project. This is really weird. My, my mouse cursor arrow has disappeared, so I'm kind of shooting blind. Um, it, it is uh, cloud infrastructure, not API authorizations, but rather analysis of infrastructure to determine if it's safe or not. And we've put out an open source project called Regula. You can get it at uh, github.com slash fugue slash Regula. And uh, you can see here that what it does is it checks Terraform prior to deployment. So, and, and it's completely open source. It's mostly made of Rego. Rego is the language of OPA. So I'm gonna, in fact, I think jump over and show you some source code. Don't run away, don't get scared. I'm gonna really explain it in a, in a I hopefully, uh, hopefully a very simple way that uh, you'll grok even if you're uh, not super technical. Okay, so uh, let me make my font a little bigger. There we go. Um, this is part of Regula. This is a Rego file. This is a program written for OPA. And it's in the form, generally speaking, of a query, making assertions. So um, remember, it's a real language. We get comments, yay. We don't have to write in YAML or JSON and worry about indentations and quoting everything. It has types in it. It's, it's a real language and you can create packages. So that's kind of awesome. So this package is called rules KMS rotate. And what we wrote here is uh, uh, just a very, very simple check to see if KMS keys are set to rotate, all right? So one of the characteristics of a good language is that doing easy things and simple things is easy. Another characteristic is that doing arbitrarily complex things is possible or are possible. So here I'm showing you the simple because we've done a lot of the complex for you in Regula. So here we are just naming the package we're saying the resource type we're gonna consider is an AWS KMS key. And you'll see we have some libraries getting back to the complexity behind the scenes that you can get for free uh, and open source that, that make this so simple. And then we're mapping it to some controls. So in this case, uh, CIS benchmark, as well as our own internal regular accounting of rules, just so we have a, a, an enumeration of controls that we can map to different families, uh, not just CIS. So here's here's the the real code though. Um, is deny if uh, not input enable key rotation. So uh, and then send the message back. And this is the important part, right? Uh, it's important to check it, but it's equally important to explain to the engineer what they need to fix, just like your compiler or interpreter or debugger will help you with. Uh, so you can send this message back saying, hey, uh, KMS key rotation should be uh, enabled. All right, so, so this is effectively, you know, it's, uh, it's four lines of code, functioning code, uh, you know, other than just the uh, declarations of some variables. Um, but two of those are, you know, mostly just angle brackets. So it's a really, really simple way to do this. You do have to get used to working with a declarative language. Another example of a declarative language is generally speaking SQL. So it's more like a query language than it's like Python. Uh, I do wanna show you that you can do the other thing I mentioned. So this is make uh, simple things, make obvious things easy, but make arbitrarily complex and difficult things possible. 
And so this is one of the libraries we ship with Regula. And this is another reason why you want a real language is so you can have libraries and you can have packages. So this package we just called Fugue. And here we're doing a bunch of work behind the scenes like you do in a library uh, to do things like define resource types and resources by type. So you can call these simple things and uh, you know, here's the resources view. We've done a lot of work in here. So I'm, I'm not showing you this to scare you, the opposite. I'm showing you that you can do, again, uh, easy things very, very easily with Regula and with OPA, but you can do very complex things. There, there's really not a, 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 an arbitrary limit on how far this can go. All right, I'm gonna show you one more thing on the web here, and then um, we can go back. And I don't know, Chris, are we taking live Q&A here? Help, help me out. I think we might've lost Chris. Um, I'll ask him. Uh, oh, Sylvia says that you guys can see my cursor. That's good. <laughs> I can see the blue ring. Okay, I got my cursor back. So showing you one more open source project, um, it's called Frego. Hey, Chris, did we, did we get you back? Should I leave some time for Q&A at the end or how do we wanna do this? Hey, hey, Josh, yeah, I'm here. I'm sorry, I just had a little delay there as I've, I've muted myself while you're giving the presentation. We've gotten one question so far. Uh, it's not really synchronous to your, your content. So uh, if you want to leave a couple minutes at the end, we can just take Q&A as well as any others that come in. Um, All right, cool. Or we can do it real time. I mean, we're, we're flexible. But yeah, I'd say go ahead and continue and just leave us like, you know, maybe three, five minutes at the end to, to address. All right, I will do that. Um, so another open source project here is called Frego, which is the Fugue Rego toolkit. It's github.com slash Fugue uh, slash Frego. And we built this for a couple of reasons. Um, what it what it will do it, it, it is its namesake it's a it's a, a toolkit for programming Rego. It will allow you to do things like setting breakpoints and uh, you know we write a whole lot of Rego at Fugue and we operate it at massive scale. So we needed tooling including a REPL and you know again the ability to do things like set breakpoints that would help us develop uh, complex Rego code because we write a lot of that. So we've put this out uh, free and open source. Um, it also happens to, because our use case is evaluating very large configuration data, well, very large compared to individual transactions um, against lots and lots and lots of rego rules, we are very sensitive to performance. So Frego is not a replacement for the OPA runtime for everyone. It doesn't run as a daemon, for example. So generally to get started, I would suggest running the, the OPA native implementation of the runtime. But Frego is also a runtime that if you're dealing with use cases similar to ours, larger data sets, uh, lots and lots and lots of library level evaluation it's about 30 to 100 times faster. And uh, we're very much based on uh, Lambda in AWS. So for us, time is money. Um, but most people who are using Frego are using it uh, to help uh, with writing Rego code. Um, so you can see we've got you know 150 or so folks. I think Regula is yeah, in the mid 200s of folks that are using it and we're you know, getting good contributions. We're very active maintainers of these. We're also contributors back to the OPA um, project itself. All right, I'm gonna show you one more way uh, to use OPA. I've got to log in to our uh, free SaaS here. So if you, we, uh, I, I promise this would not be a product demo. I'm just gonna show you how we use OPA in the product. Um, it's not gonna be a full product demo. Let me log in here. So what we do is a SaaS for uh, cloud security and cloud uh, configuration. Um, and if you're at a, a, an, an individual contributor level with like less than 1500 cloud resources, it's free forever. 
Um, so, I'm, but I'm, I'm just gonna show you what OPA does here for, for um, at the runtime, because I said earlier in the deck, right? If I go back to my, to my deck here, um, you know, we want this through the entire SDLC. So Regula is handling the design time if you're using Terraform. Uh, Regula can also help you during deploy time by building Regula into your CI CD pipeline. But when you run a Terraform template, for example, the infrastructure you get is more than what was defined in the template. What I mean by that is API, cloud APIs have side effects. So when you're defining an individual you know, EC2 instance, for example, you are saying, and give me a volume. And that volume, a disk volume, EBS volume, generally folks do that. It has its own characteristics. If you create a VPC network, uh, you're, if you don't narrowly specify every parameter of it, you're going to get things like default routing tables and, and uh, default security groups. And those can't always be inferred from the uh, infrastructure as code template. That's what I mean by side effects. So you also need to carry this through into the runtime, in our opinion. Now, the beauty of OPA is you can use the same rules the whole way through. So uh, in the past, you know, infrastructure as code vendors would put like some security stuff out for their IAC stuff, but then you couldn't use that once it was deployed. You just had to believe, have faith that nothing would ever change in production. Well, guess what it does, and everyone knows that. And so another set of policy as code is typically used uh, to check it. Well, those things aren't going to agree in all cases. If you've ever tried to write a program in two different languages and get it to perform exactly the same, you know what I mean. Uh, it, it is a true challenge, and it's honestly not feasible in, in the long run and at scale. So the beauty of using OPA through this whole thing is the exact same collection of policy as code can be uh, employed throughout the entire life cycle. So I'm going to show you here how we do that at Fugue in the runtime. And again, for developers, this is free forever. But you're, you're you know, you're welcome to to uh, implement something similar. It's a it's a lot of work. Uh, so what you're seeing here is uh, we we like to visualize. Um, I'm just going to full screen the visualization. We like to visualize infrastructure because uh, it's really hard to understand just big long lists and contextualize it. So what we're showing here just to co contextualize this is over on the left is the internet going into a gateway, into a load balancer, and some EC2 instances. And we generate these diagrams automatically and, and make them interactive. Uh, and one of the main reasons we do that is to show where there are dangerous configurations or what we call misconfigurations. So any of these red guys, like let's look at this load balancer. Um, you can see here we're interrogating the entire configuration, but in terms of why it turned red, OPA is doing that. We've written hundreds of these OPA rules. And in this case, uh, the ELB listener or, uh, source protocol should be encrypted. Right, we should be using HTTPS generally, not HTTP. Uh, and similarly, cross zone load balancing should be enabled. Access logging should be enabled. So these are pretty simple misconfigurations in that they're concerned only with one resource. But we also have to think about misconfigurations that cross over resource types. So I want to show you a little more um, Rego because OPA can do this. Uh, most of the proprietary stuff out there struggles to do this. It can, it can like look at individual resource types. But the beautiful thing with OPA uh, is you can, you can look across multiple types and look at how those things relate. So if you're not a programmer and you're not used to declarative languages, this might be a little scary. I'm going to try to make it easy to understand. So here we're just collecting up all the policy resources. And you can see those right here. So these are different kinds of resources in the cloud. An IAM user policy, an IAM user policy attachment to something, 
and an IAM policy attachment itself. You might think those are all the same, they're not. And so here we're saying IAM policies should not be directly attached to users. We should be attaching them via, you know, a, 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 a group, okay? Uh, and that's best practice according to AWS. And so here you can see, uh, we, we collect up the resources, um, we say uh, is invalid uh, based on those, and then we assert uh, the policy uh, on those resources based on whether or not they're attached directly to users. So as you're looking at running infrastructure, that's regular, so that's going to be looking at um, pre-deployment. But you can also look at these things on the fly. Like let's say somebody goes into the console and creates a new user and attaches directly an IAM policy. Well, that, that same infrastructure's code that worked pre-deployment will also function uh, uh, post-deployment if you're, if you're using this kind of approach, whether you're using our product um, or not. Okay, uh, I think I just have, yeah, so how to get started. Uh, the first thing to do is just go to openpolicyagent.org and uh, check out, you know, read up on it, go to their GitHub repo, and you can learn a whole lot there. So right here, uh, concrete examples uh, for integrating uh, OPA with Kubernetes, Terraform, Docker, et cetera, you know, go explore these, learn a little bit about Rego. So here we're talking about ingress validation. This is not the use case Fugue is focused on. Um, and here you can see they have a small example of Terraform. Uh, it, over here in Regula, you can see we cover a whole bunch of stuff uh, on AWS, on GCP, and on Azure just out of the box. So um, you can learn a lot uh, by looking through the source code that we've written. I would suggest uh, first starting with a, maybe uh, some of the simple examples we give. Um, let's look at, uh, again, KMS Rotate. You know, just, just try to understand what the code is doing before you start diving into the libraries where more complexity lies. Um, excuse me. There are a lot of good examples in here as well, just showing you some basic stuff around Rego. And then, you know, try it out, stand up a daemon and shoot some data at it or just use it as a library. Frego is really handy for this because you, you actually don't need to do that. If you just uh, run Frego and it's available, it's actually a Haskell program, not a Go program. So it might be a, a, a little more challenging to contribute to, uh, but if you're a Haskeller and you wanna help with writing like super fast and developer friendly OPA tools, we would love to have your contributions. Uh, and if you're not a Haskeller, uh, you know, it's a really cool and fun language. Um, but this will give you, again, a REPL. A REPL is where you're programming and getting instantaneous feedback uh, with a lot of uh, additional functionality over the stock OPA REPL. So it's a way to just write little bits of code and learn as you go. All right, we're at 42 after the hour. So um, here are the resources that I, I put up there. And if anyone has any questions, um, I see a couple. All right. Um, Eric asks, have we seen any use cases involving policy as code to evaluate data or metadata structures? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, particularly metadata. I mean, you can think of what Fugue are doing, what we're doing here when we, oops, I'm rotating the wrong screen. What we're doing over here is we're actually uh, grabbing all of the metadata related to resources on the cloud and then analyzing that versus OPA. So all you really need is a JSON data structure. Uh, you could certainly, uh, I've not done it myself, uh, or, or I shouldn't say myself, we at Fugue have not been doing this, but for example, if you had uh, some kind of data extract from a database or something and wanted to check for uh, social security numbers. I mean, OPA could do that. All right. Um, John asks, 
Are there predefined rule sets for AWS we can grab and run against our Terraform? Yes, you can. <laughs> uh, that's what this thing is uh, that we put out there, Regula. So you can see we're doing CloudFront, CloudTrail, EBS, IAM, KMS, S3, VPC. Uh, and we also uh, handle other clouds in Regula and we're adding to it and we welcome you to make contributions. So uh, absolutely, uh, Regula is, is for you if you want to uh, use it with Terraform. Um, that's, that's what it's for. It's going to operate against your Terraform plan and tell you at the plan stage prior to deployment uh, whether what you're doing um, is, uh, is dangerous or not. Uh, and of course, you can add your own OPA rules to this. And also in our product, you can have your own OPA rules in a Git repo or whatever you like. 